okay, I think the tech part seems reasonable. So um, let's start the meeting. I just want to point out to everyone that David Matt is co-hosting this meeting. He'll be the one in charge. If you have questions, you can either text him or you can raise your hand. There's a way of doing that on Zoom. Um, and um, he'll make sure that I'm alerted to the questions. Please feel free to ask anything you like. No holds barred, and I'll do my best to reply. So I think, David, I will give you the first question. Go ahead. Okay, this is a short question. Uh, in your humble opinion, can one be awake and also somewhat neurotic? Oh, definitely. In fact, being awake involves noticing one's own neuroticism. And that's a really excellent question because there's been this controversy in the last few days about beyond personality, um, which a, a friend of mine, probably an ex-friend now, um, has been pushing pretty hard. And in my view, there is no beyond personality. There is noticing one's personality. It doesn't go away. You don't get beyond it because you notice it. You work with it. So if you know that you have a tendency to be anger, angered quickly, to anger quickly, but you're awake, when the anger starts to come up, you won't blame the other person. You'll say, wow, this is me. This is Robert. So just cool your jets, man. And that's why when you meet people who are awake, they seem to have a, I don't know, kind of a lightness to them. If you've ever noticed that they're fun to be around and they don't make you feel, they don't belittle you. They don't make you feel lesser than. And um, so, so awake means noticing oneself. It does not mean, as the guru, so many of the gurus try to teach, that you become something else entirely, more than human, as I think that's a book title, more than human. No, you are fully human in the sense that you understand that each human being has problems and uh, a background, parents and a childhood and an upbringing and a culture and all of these things that make us who we are in, in, in society and in culture. And uh, that is not never erased, it's embraced. I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, here's one more. Uh, in your interview with Rick Archer, you said that you don't need anything, you don't want anything, you are satisfied. And you've also said that you have a strong sense that you are not the doer. Are those two things related? Uh, well, the sense of not being a doer, I think, comes through understanding that our thoughts and feelings arise as they do. They kind of bubble up like the bubbles in a glass of seltzer. And we're not making them. We become aware of them when they come to consciousness, but we don't choose our thoughts and feelings. And since we don't choose our thoughts and feelings, when we find ourselves doing something, it's not that we have decided to do it. It's that the thoughts and feelings that bubbled up caused us to do it. So that's the non-doer part. Uh, when I say I'm satisfied, that's more of a, a comment on my good fortune in life. I've, I'm, I'm a lucky person. I was born into a good family I, with an intact body and mind in a central country where uh, 
at least in those days, the politics wasn't totally crazy. And all of these, I had a good education, met great people in my life. So that's what I mean by not wanting anything. At a certain point, I realized that I already had been given everything that a human can uh, rightly desire. And so I, I just don't ask for anything more. I, I have what I need. In the in the context of that interview, I, I, I had the feeling that the discussion was related to awakening or enlightenment and that, you know, Rick was saying, yes, in uh, according to all the scriptures, that's kind of a prediction that when one is awake, that will be the experience of uh, being satisfied and not feeling that you need to get the next thing and that kind of thing. Oh, well, that might be part of it. I, I, you know, I really don't know when you asked me when the, you asked me if there was a, a connection, mm -hmm. I, I looked into it and couldn't really find anything. But yeah, maybe Rick's right about that. I don't I really don't know. I, I do know that I had a, a very startling experience about 35 years ago, after which um, it took me a couple of years to digest that and to admit to myself that what had happened to me was the same kind of thing that I had always read about and heard had happened to other people who were considered awake. And so I had to kind of, well, it was difficult um, to accept that because it feels narcissistic to say, well, I'm awake. But on the other hand, if you don't, um, you'll be denying something about your experience. So um, here I sit, an awake person. I'm not saying I'm equivalent to the Buddha. That would be kind of narcissistic. But I'm awake in the sense that I see myself clearly and um, don't have any difficulty with personality. It's just. It's just here. And that, that was my, I guess I should say something about that because I know people were aware of that. Um, Jez has been a friend of mine. He and I did a nice interview a few years ago. I really like him. And a lot of the things that he says are true in my experience. He has a very good outlook on a lot of things. But in my view, he took it too far when he said, that there was a way of getting beyond personality and that he kind of could lead you into that way. I don't think there is such a place. And even if there is, I don't think anybody can lead anybody into anything. This is where he and I differ. And this is where I differ from a lot of the so-called spiritual teachers. If you were playing a game of Monopoly, someone couldn't just pick up your piece and move it ahead on the board, all these squares, just, just because you wanted that done, you would have to roll the dice. And life, as I see it, is like that. If you want to learn, you have to suffer. Nobody can just take your, your, your suffering away and give you a shortcut, because awakening doesn't happen through hearing certain words. That, will, that, that may alert you to the to the fact that there is such a thing as being awake that's good but the words will not awaken you you have to do the suffering that's the whole point it's your it's your life that has to be lived not the not that the teacher can uh, move take your piece on a monopoly board and just jump it ahead it doesn't work that way you, we all might want to be on the boardwalk but that's not the way it's going to happen see uh, okay, I, I see somebody else has a question, but I just want to do one quick follow up on, on the point you just raised. Um, so the people who, you know, did read your books and did say, hey, you know, this changed my life or my the boat has been capsized. In those cases, it seems like those words somehow did uh, move things along somehow. Um. Oh, that's such a deep question. It just opens up. A... If someone reads my book 
and says my boat has been capsized. I think what they mean is I was seeking spiritual enlightenment and now I'm not, which in my view is a really good thing. I don't think it means that that reading my book awakened them. I think what it did is put them back on the highway instead of off on this long um, desviacion. I can't think of the word in English. Um, uh, Detour. Detour, thank you. Thank you, who's that? Thanks, yes. So the spiritual teaching, in my view, is a detour. It, what it does is it tells you you're not okay the way you are, but here's a series of steps you will follow. And at the end of that following, following these steps, you will be awake or you will be enlightened. That is a detour because what it feels like to be awake, this is my my personal experience, other people may disagree with what the word awake means, I know they do. But in my understanding, what it feels like for me to be awake is that all I have is now. And it's always now. And I have no project to improve anything. My, my project is to live in this moment and realizing that I'm going to die. And there won't be any self-improvement that can stop that from happening. So enjoy this moment while you have it. You see, the achievement is, is in the moment. The, what, what, we, what one achieves, in my view, in my opinion, is the ability to just sit here and be okay. And I don't see any achievement beyond that. I know some people do, and that's fine if they want to be on that what I consider a detour, I can respect that until they aren't anymore. So I think that what some people have gotten from my books is permission to get back on the highway, which is right here and now, instead of imagining that that Swami so-and-so or whoever it may be had the keys to the highway. Uh, that's not true in my opinion. I don't know if that answers. I yeah, know that. That, that's a great answer, thank you. Okay, I see that Roseanne has her hand raised. Uh, you can unmute Roseanne and uh, ask your questions. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thanks, Robert, for having another one of these. I was on one of yours uh, about a year ago, I guess. It was a small group. Um, I'm really here, and I'm a little nervous, so just bear with me. Um, I'm really here to say thank you again and to um, share that indeed uh, the things that you had sort of you know, the things you say in your books uh, will happen as a result of realizing some of these things you bring forth in the book has happened for me or is happening for me. I have found a freedom and a peace in um, putting down, in my particular situation, I got heavily into A Course in Miracles. And, um, and after five years of that, found myself searching for something that no one else around me was interested in searching for. It was essentially something beyond what this book was telling us. And through some, you know, various videos I watched. One in particular was an interview you had, Robert, with Tim Freaky, I think is how you pronounce his last name, but he was one of the folks I was listening to to try to find what was seemed to be missing for me uh, in studying the course, as we would say. But long story short, um, like I said, I've just found such a peace in realizing that I didn't need to search anymore. Um, I had heard you on the video and then heard about your books right at the beginning of the year of 2021. And in A Course in Miracles, if you're a student, you start the lessons again over, lesson one again uh, on January 1st. You do these lessons every day. And um, the moment that I realized I could put down this book and stop doing these lessons. 
was such a relief for me. I, I can't explain it. It was like an, a weight was taken off my shoulders. And I realized, uh, you know, as the months went by right after that weight was lifted, the, the repetition of those Course in Miracles lessons and the brainwashing factor of them, you know, it, it really bothered me. I know some people have expressed, I've heard in uh, videos with you, that A Course in Miracles sort of helped them get to the next step. Um, I don't see it so much that way for me. When I shared it with you in the last live stream about A Course in Miracles, you, you told me I was unmoored. I was unmoored at this point, and that's what I was. I was feeling very, very down and very upset about the course not working and not knowing where I was going to go next. So you, uh, your books have really helped me get beyond that. Well, thank you so much, Rosanne. It's really nice to hear that. I understand why people would like to believe that what they are will never die. Um, it's a very seductive, hypnotic idea, but it's just, in my opinion, not true at all. Each one of us is um, an entity, an animal, and uh, we've all seen other animals die, other humans and our pets and all of this. And um, so all the things I've learned, my psychology training, the languages I speak, all of this, when this brain dies, that will all go away, see? But that is me. What other me could there be than thoughts and feelings and information that I've acquired? Um, so I think that is what I'm saying in my work in the two books that I wrote is to snap out of this hypnotic trance that promises you a lot but never gives it to you you don't get there you have to go to the next Eckhart Tolle pay him again and if you tell him but Eckhart I'm, I'm still feeling bad he says well then you're not doing it right see that's the problem uh, it's a it's a promise that can't be kept that well, spirituality is hypno is hypnotic it 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 keeps repeating a promise and people keep chasing after that promise, but they never really get there. I, I don't know anyone who's gotten there as a result of following instructions. I mean, I, I've had conversations with a lot of people by now about, about what they mean by awake. And um, it's something grandiose for some of these people. It's you will know everything. You'll understand the universe. Uh, there, there, you, there won't be. You'll never be angry. There won't be a you anymore. You'll understand that um, non-duality is the is the truth. No, it isn't. It's an, a human idea. I, I've never seen any non-duality in anybody I've met. Have you? Someone who has no. No likes and dislikes, no, none of it. And then the other argument that non-dual people say is, well, the likes and dislikes are part of it. It's all non-dual, whatever's arising. Okay, well, that's, that's okay. But if that's okay, then the work's over. You got it. Now shut up. <laughs> don't, keep, don't keep rattling on about how great this is, because it isn't. We have, look at this world, it's sad. It's really sad. Look at this shit that's going on, people. And then I understand what's happening in Ukraine where people are just being killed for no reason at all and starving to death in, in, in basements. You know, I'm sorry to be so, uh, I'm sorry to be such a downer. <laughs> But Unless we can really accept that and stop being bliss ninnies and just aiming at being happy all the time, which is what I have against the spiritual people. They think you're supposed to be happy. That's the goal. Well, no, there isn't any happiness in this planet. There is a slight alleviation of suffering, which can happen to people. And that feels good. And then you say you're happy. But can you really be happy when you look around you and take a wide view 
I don't think so. I think if someone is sitting there self-satisfied and blissed out, that's just a hypnotic trance. That's denial. The people that I most respect are the people who understand that and do something about it, serve in some way to alleviate other people's suffering instead of trying to be happy. And in my experience, when you actually take an active role in life of any kind, it could be just washing the dishes so your wife doesn't have to do it. That's when you will begin to feel happy, not because everything's perfect and la di da, but because when you make that movement out of myself and what I have and what I need and all the rest of it, then you don't notice your own suffering which is really a beautiful thing. I wanted to point out, Robert, that you uh, took a lot of grief away from me because after reading 4T on a flight from Houston about three years ago, two and a half years ago, I immediately, I mean, I have a boatload of books on non-duality in the next room and it was driving me nuts because I was questing and searching and begging and getting nowhere. And I had the precise experience of speaking to several of these people in person, one of whom you mentioned. And I was told precisely that. I wasn't doing it right. What really bothered me though after throwing all that stuff literally in the trash, that I don't consider myself an awake person on the highway, as it were. And that was a gross, gross disappointment for me because I thought that would happen automatically. And it hasn't. And I found that particularly disturbing. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if you imagine that being awake is something special. And when you compare your ordinary experience to that something special, the ordinary experience comes off in second place. But in my, yeah. view, in my view, we're all awake right now, but we don't all notice it. Awake just means aware. It just means aware. That's all it is. There is no awake in this grand sense where suddenly everything is healed and you know everything and you won't you will never die and now you're identified with the whole universe and all that. That's just religious nonsense. It's 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 like the it's like the uh, stuff that Roseanne was talking about in the Course of Miracles. That book promises all kinds of things, but, and then if you compare your ordinary experience to what that book is telling you your experience should be like, you come off second, second best. Mm -hmm. so I would encourage you, I'm not giving you an instruction here, Don, but I just encourage you to understand that you may be awake right now. What a surprise to me, because I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, my assessment, my interpretation of awake has indeed been somewhat more grandiose than your description. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. And when I started doing this a few years ago, um, I offended a lot of people because I would intentionally use bad language and be angry and all that. And I was acting a little bit, whipping it up, because I really wanted to make it clear that I'm just an ordinary person. I'm not some perfected being who sits here with absolute knowledge and all that. I'm just an ordinary citizen. What happened is I just realized that I'm not doing it. There is no Robert who's who's doing anything. All of this is just arising 
and we call it Robert. People see my body and they say, well, that's Robert. But they don't know where any of this stuff is coming from, not from Robert. Robert is just like the shell. He's the, he's the sock, sock puppet. A, me, a medium. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting because after reading Forte, I was sitting next to my wife. I was like, I got to meet this guy. He's really unique. And shortly thereafter, I heard you speak as, you know, he doesn't think of himself the way I think of him at all, <laughs> which surprised me greatly. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I expect you to be wearing a turban and, and, and flinging towers, uh, flowers at your followers, but uh, you really surprised me. I'm not going to use the word humility per se, but you really are just another guy. And that was hard for me to swallow because I was still looking for something special. Let me give you a quick example. Many years ago with my girlfriend, prior to my being married, I better get that out of the way quickly. And my wife may be listening, but it's true. Uh, we were having a chat and I asked her what she thought of me. She said, well, you're just an average guy. And I lost it. I would have rather been compared to Joe Goebbels, anything but average, anything. And uh, I realize now, of course, that's a problem. That's a problem. There was this need for specialness. And uh, I've had that my whole life. I'm not special. No, I'm not either. I'm not either are you. No, mm -hmm. no, I'm not special. I'm bright. But, but so are a lot I, of other people. I, so I can bring that as about, I have that qualification too. Doesn't make me special. Well, it also, if you start congratulating yourself on being bright, then you're going to have to take Einstein and all those people into consideration. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote, I don't know if you read <laughs> one of my submissions, then, yeah. but yeah, I, I spoke about that. Okay. I got hold of a little pamphlet called Relativity, and I was a physics major at the time, and I did what I was doing well. By the time I got to page 30, my mind was swirling. I couldn't do a damn thing with it. Well, <laughs> and, it. And this guy did it with pencil and paper while working as a clerk in a patent office. He didn't even have a lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, and anyway, I'm far from unique, far from unique also in this point of view. Um, I, I do have some good abilities at self-expression, and mm -hmm. so that may help. But my friend John Troy would agree with everything that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and he's able to speak these things also in his own way. Something from, something from John Troy really touched me. There was a, a bit of a heated debate going on, uh, and he simply wrote, some bloom, some don't. That's the story, Morning Glory. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Robert. I'm Jen. Hi, Jen. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having this meeting. Um, I wanted to thank you for your books. Um, I uh, I was never, I've never been, I wasn't raised with religion, never been a quote unquote, you know, spiritual seeker or anything like that. Um, and for some reason, I don't remember what happened, but I, I stumbled on to, depending on no thing, um, oh, I think it was about a year or so ago. And I, I, I stumbled onto it before I stumbled onto 4T. And I was reading it and um, I also became sick. And uh, it was like the kind of sickness where they put me in quarantine because everything looks like COVID in a pandemic. Um, it turned out that wasn't it. And so there was this one fine morning where I went into cardiac arrest in my living room in front of my husband. Um, and so I called, I actually called 911. And that was, an, that was a moment where it was really a moment to moment thing. Like it, it became so undeniable 
that every moment was just so completely unique. And there was absolutely no guarantee that another one was coming. There was no knowledge that, you know, that, that there was anything next. Um, there was just a sort of a, life was like being on a dimmer switch. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I can remember locking into the eyes of the paramedic and just every moment was an acute moment. And it was the most precious thing in the world. And it was potentially the last. Um, and it just so happened that I had that book and um, after I was taken to the, the hospital and actually, obviously here I am, I, I, I survived. Um, but I had, you know, my daughter bring that book to me in the hospital. And I wanted to thank you because it really helped me to make sense. I've had these experiences since I was a child where I always felt like I didn't see the world the same as others. But I was always really curious and didn't see things the same way. So after, um, after this event, I can also recall being in the hospital. It was COVID. No one was allowed to see me. Um, people didn't know what was up with me. Nobody knew, aside from like my husband who was there when I collapsed and my daughter. Uh, nobody knew I was there or anything. And I saw what the world was like basically in my absence. Um, and this whole thing about the death sort of just became um, very much almost like a relief. Like they're just, there it is. And it's going to happen. And I don't have to worry about it. What, it, it'll happen when it happens you know it's like you get it when you get it um, but I saw the world fine in my absence and un, and I was unnecessary um, and I was completely alone with every single thing and all I had was d-o-n-t and my own mind um, and uh, it was it was a real changing experience so I really wanted to come on today. I'm, I'm new to your work and I'm, this is my first time participating with the group. I'm new to the Facebook group. Um, but because it was so profound and it really did help me to, to finally to understand um, what awakeness was, I, I, be, I believe that I, I hate the word belief, but it, 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 is an, it, it is perceived by me that some of these separate perceptions that I have just simply are a function of perhaps awakeness. So I wanted to ask you about that. And then I, I did really truly want to thank you because um, the books that you made were really helpful at a time when I had a, a lot of serious questions uh, and a lot of unique experiences. And it helped me to, to make sense of everything that was coming into me all these new inputs that I'd never experienced before and didn't quite know how to handle as they were all coming at me faster than um than I knew what to do with okay that's a great report um some of these near-death experiences are really helpful a lot of people gain perspective and uh, understand that dying is really no big deal it's just going to happen when it does, as it does. We seem to be so afraid of not being anymore, but there's really nothing to lose. I mean, we live as we do until we don't anymore. That seems to be the situation for all of us. And I think part of being awake is just accepting that it's okay. I don't have it to. actually feels like a relief. Yes, it's a great. It's absolutely, it's freeing. It is. There's just there's there's just nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So my wife has a serious allergy to sesame seeds, so she has been in the emergency room four times, one time in a coma, and the other three times gasping for breath and anaphylactic shock and um, a couple of those the doctor was shaking his head looking at the other doctors and did, saying it doesn't look good and I was I was standing there observing this and um, I looked into her eyes and I saw a moment when she wasn't really there anymore and then she came back so later when we talked about it, her experience was that she saw me looking at her with concern 
And then, then she didn't anymore. It was okay. Everything was okay. So I think that's really good information. Everything is okay. The end of it. Yeah. You may suffer and be afraid to a certain extent, but the end of it, according to her report, is it's okay. everything is okay. Bye. Goodbye, Robert. Everything's okay. Yeah. And I, 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 I would I would agree. It it was it was okay. I was yeah. just staying focused and, and if the next moment didn't come, then it didn't come. So I think that's a far better interpretation of a near death experience than the one that says, I was still there. I died. No, you didn't die. You came close to dying. I, I died and I was floating in the room looking down at myself. Yeah, maybe that happens to somebody, but it, 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 it wasn't my experience. I think that does happen, but but you're not dead when it happens. <laughs> you see, they yes, it's a near dead. A near death is not death. And these people that use that to talk about souls and heaven and all that, um, I, that's, a, that's a bad interpretation, I think, that gives people a false idea that there's going to be some afterlife, and there's actually no evidence for that at all. None. Continuum. As I, um, and it was, you know, in between these various episodes, I was, it was a very interesting thing because the, the damage I sustained made me for quite some time aware of literally every single heartbeat. And I think most of us, when we, people, we meditate, we focus on the breath, but I mean, literally none of us really feel every heartbeat. And that was a really unique experience. And if that didn't lock in to me, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, ex the experience of a moment and not knowing, you know, each heartbeat was precious because it was a moment. And I didn't know if I'd get another. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was the most unusual thing I've ever been through, and something that could that I could look at and I could understand and say, "Oh yeah, so this is just kind of how it is," and this isn't unique to me, and this is just my experience, and this is reasonably the way it is for me. Like I see the sun as orange. Well, it's a great report. Thank you. And I'm glad the books have been helpful to you. That's really nice to hear. It, it, they are. And I will continue to recommend that people take a look at them um, and think deeply. Um, and I do have a lot of appreciation for your work. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is something that I do like to share with people if I believe that they may be you know, open enough, um, because I think they could benefit from it but you never know when you will thank you well thank you well carry on david rui is next so you can go ahead rui hi robert hello can you hear me? hi 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 nice to, to talk with you again um yeah um I'm still finishing depending on those things. So um, I really like to um, digest it like bite by bite, like you say on your metaphor. So it's, it's pretty good. I don't want to read it all at once so that it lasts a little bit longer. Um, I, I do have a, a question um, that it's not really uh, a conflict, I would say, but it, it's something I, I'm curious to hear how you your stand on this. So, I work I work with people as a coach, and I and I and I use this grounding uh, that it's slowly unfolding with um, with reading your books and and being being looking to your videos and and all the things that happened before and. And there is this topic about free will and and I work a lot with people to look at their assumptions and and as we work, they get a lot of insights from and clarity from from the assumptions they have made over the years and sometimes really young ages and 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 one of the things when we look forward to the future um we can do something like creating intentions. 
So there is an intention to go in a certain direction. And I wonder how you see that in terms of the free will umbrella. Um, because I understand very well the awakening in terms of what happened in the past, what's happening now, and that there's no one actually did any of that. that it's something we can't explain. There's a mystery here. We tend to be able to tell a certain story that makes sense to us. And, and, and you talk a lot about this phenom phenomenology. And um, we also have some, some like science to support a lot of what we're trying to make sense of. But I think my question is how we concile free will or the absence of free will with working with people setting, setting intentions so that they will achieve something in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this seems complicated, but it's really simple. <laughs> Let me try to explain. Whenever you see something or hear something or otherwise experience anything, no matter what it is, there's a response that comes up automatically, immediately. If someone tells you, God, you're an asshole, immediately there'll be a, a feeling, whatever. It might be anger, it might be laughter. You do not make that. That's instantaneous. That's automatic. It's not something you don't will your reactions. You're with that so far? It has mm -hmm. an immediate thing. This is an immediate thing. It's like driving down the highway. If a car crosses the median and you might, you just swerve later, you, you'll say, wow, good thing I swerved. But you didn't decide to swerve. You just swerved. This is an immediate reaction to events. Okay, so if you are a coach, a life coach, and you tell me, Robert, you should lose 10 pounds, you need to change your diet. I'll have an immediate reaction to that, you see, you, you need to get in shape, Robert, I'll have a, an immediate reaction to this that I, that I do not choose. So your right, so your advice if it hits one person, it could become an intention. If it hits another person, the person could choose a new coach. You're not in control of that, and either is the person who takes that action. That doesn't mean that your coaching is useless. It means that there's no way that anyone can choose to either accept or reject the teaching. If someone hears the teaching and it makes sense and they accept it, that's what happened. The next person is sitting in the same room will hear exactly the same teaching or advice and they won't accept it. And that's what happened. So it's not that we don't influence one another. We do influence one another. And I think people do a lot better listening to me than they do to some other people I can I could mention, but I won't. <laughs> but they, you, you can't choose to, to accept advice or not. That's just what happens. And then someone who believes in free will will argue, oh, yes, I can choose. I can read the books. I can investigate. Yes, that all that might happen. But this next person standing right next to you hears the same stuff and they don't read the books and make the decisions. So whatever we find ourselves doing, it, another way of looking at this that I've written about a lot is there's no actual little Robert sitting in, inside of me deciding what to accept and reject. Robert is what he accepts and rejects. Robert is what he eats and doesn't eat. There's no little Robert in there saying, oh, I mustn't. You see, we say this to ourselves, I mustn't have that chocolate because I'm trying to get in shape here. You see, we say that, but you're either going to eat that chocolate or you're not. And if, yeah. yes, so I don't know, is that clear enough or? Yeah, no, it, it was very helpful. And I think it aligns with um, why I, 
abandoned a little bit an approach that I had before, which was a bit dogmatic and a bit uh, spiritual. That was like the principles behind the human experience. Like if there is something that is really 100% true and happens all the time, you know. And once I step away from that, and again, thanks for, for the book really helped me to snap out of it. Uh, setting an intention with a client, for example, knowing that I have no control over him and neither does he, but we can try to influence each other. So that, that brings me so much more freedom as well um, to my work in that sense. And so basically what I'm trying to say is that although I was seeing as a conflict that I said, potentially it's not a conflict, I'm just making it up as a conflict. Uh, and I guess it's because the coaching profession is very uh, associated with this kind of goal mindset and, and, and objectives and accountability and all that. But the work I actually want to do with people, it, it's not in that direction, but more in the direction that I want to be a good influence to, to other people, but knowing the limitations of the work as well. So, and I think you helped me a lot now with this clarification. Yeah, well, see, this is what the Japanese call ikigai, which, which means to find something in your own life that serves others and that you can do well and that makes you feel happy to do. That, that's considered a, a wonderful thing if you can find your ikigai. So if your ikigai is coaching, Godspeed, keep doing it and just understand that you are not responsible for the results. We can not really predict what yeah. anyone else is going to do. We can, we can advise them. Yes, I mean, if if someone asks me what how to live, I mean, I will say, get up in the morning, go for a walk, come back and eat some healthy food and do something that you like to do. I might say that to someone, but they might say, well, I couldn't do that. When I get up in the morning, I want to sit there and drink 10 coffees and smoke, smoke a pack of camels or something. I can't stop that person from doing it. I can tell them it feels good to be fit. It's nice to get some exercise every day. It feels great to eat right. I could tell the person that. That's my experience. But... I mean, I'm 77 years old. I'm in pretty good shape. I'm happy. Yeah. Yes. But you can tell someone that, but you can't make them. Well, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. Says Robert. <laughs> yeah, See, that's, this? that's a very good metaphor. Uh, on another note, just because um, my wife was here with me, but she couldn't join and she, she, she did have a question for you very quickly, which was, you talk a lot about this aliveness, that it's here right now. And as you know, I, I, I text you a couple of times, she's going through a very uh, critical moment, uh, a lot of suffering in, on a daily basis. And she was wondering, how can I experience this aliveness or in the midst of, of so much suffering? That's a really great question, Rui. The, the, the truth is, as I see it, suffering is part of this aliveness. It's actually a very big part of it. I, I really feel for your wife because it's really difficult to uh, be in a situation like that where you're really suffering and begin to feel, is this worth it or not? Um, I've actually been in that situation. Um, I broke my back a few years ago in a boating accident. Uh, and uh, I had some complex surgery and I was in bed for four months um, in terrible pain most of the time, a lot of the time. And I had a lot of suicidal thoughts during that period of thinking this isn't worth it an overdose of pills might be a good way to go and stuff like that. So I can really sympathize for, with your wife's situation with personal experience. And I guess the only thing you can do is encourage her to hang in there because things change and uh, 
it might be a lot better later. That is, does not conflict. Someone might say, well, Robert, you say there is no later. That's right, there's no later, but there's a now, and the now might require imagining that I won't always be this way. Something can change, and that's true, life can change. I'm really very happy that I did not um, end my life when I, I don't think I was ever really that close to it. Although I did have this conversation with my wife about if she was be willing to put a plastic bag over my head after I took the pills, just to be sure. And she was horrified. <laughs> so, I mean, we can get into these extreme situations and I, of extreme turn of mind. And I guess your wife sometimes feels that way. Um, I'm sorry, I really am. It's terrible and it's hard for you, but mm -hmm. you're a coach, keep coaching her. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate it, and and I and I agree with what you said. Um, it it's not always the, the suffering is not always there in the sense, or it doesn't manifest always in suffering. So their 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 laughter, they're not very often, but um, but yeah, I think the the wanting to, which is obvious, right, in such situation, the wanting to pass and 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 get rid of this suffering uh, sometimes uh, doesn't help but but it's it's almost human behavior as well right so you can't nobody i i mean i was never in her situation i just cannot can only imagine but based on what you're saying as well it's 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 like she doesn't choose right she doesn't choose to want to get rid of suffering she's just it's like wired in her she just wants to 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 move past it, but by not seeing results and evidences that she can recover, of course, um, it's it's hard to to digest it uh, every day in a very very similar situation. Yeah, but I, I appreciate your words, and then time will tell. Hopefully, um, we will be able to be in a better position in the future. But I appreciate your honesty and your words. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now I'm coaching you to hang in there yourself. You know, yeah. you, you have a beautiful smile. Be happy. Thank you. Okay. David, it's your, the, it's your. Okay. Yeah. So there's a scientist named Andrew Huberman who did a two hour podcast about the scientific research regarding dopamine. He suggested some life hacks you can do to help you become happier and more productive based on that research. So my question is, how does that kind of thing relate to your point that trying to be better than who you already are is what keeps you from being awake in the first place? Um, I'm not quite sure if I've got the, the idea. He, he right. says there's some life hacks to increase dopamine. Yeah, yeah, he's done research on dopamine and he did a two hour podcast, you know, talking about his research. And mm -hmm. the point is, hey, if you, follow these you know kind of scientific suggestions you can you can be happier more productive etc uh so it made me think of how you talk about um you know trying to be better than who you already are is what keeps you from being awake in the first place i think you've said something like that oh okay i now i get it um Eventually, it's going to come down to this moment. Um, we, we talked about death and dying before. Um, there, will be a, there, there will be a moment when one understands that there is no future. That, that's coming to all of us. Be, awake, awake is when you know that now. Not when, not when you're dying, when you realize that everything is always changing and eventually this body is going to change into something inert. And so there's nothing wrong with trying to do better for yourself in terms of what you eat, what you read, 
who your friends are, whatever. If that can all be improved, no, no doubt about it. But the improvement takes place in the present, not in the future. So, I mean, one life hack for increasing dopamine is a, a glass of scotch. Works great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably not the best the best method because if it becomes an addiction the dopamine won't be stimulated anymore and you'll just end up an alcoholic so if there's a life hack that this guy mentioned which does not involve ingesting some noxious substance um that's beautiful i mean i just i just talked about some of my life hacks even if i don't feel like it I go for a walk every morning. I usually do feel like it, but if I wake up and I'm just not feeling too much like it, I will still try to force myself to go out and do it because I know I'll feel better if I do than if I sit around and not do it. Yes? I mean, that is not a question of working for the future. It's a question of what you're doing in this moment. So, Yes, this is this is hard. This is very hard to talk about. Uh, it's my, our language doesn't really have a have a way of referring to this directly. That's why I like to use a lot of metaphors. I can't think of one right now. But I'm living. Let me put it this way: we're having we're having this meeting, and I'm entirely here. I have no future. This might be my last meeting. This might, this, someone else might be having a meeting like this and recording it and thinking, well, after I have the meeting, everyone will see the recording and I'll become more and more famous and my books will, I, you see, I, I understand all that, but I don't have that. I only have this replying to you. It's my entire world. It really is. And that's what I mean by awake. Just whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, it doesn't have to be speaking. If you're, if you're um, washing the dishes, really look at the dish, actually wash it. And this is what the Zen people always talked about, you know, from uh, carrying wood, chopping wood and carrying water. That's what life is. So if we imagine a life where I don't have to carry water anymore and I don't have to chop wood anymore well then what will you be doing oh well then I'll be lying back on my lounge in the garden and sipping a nice glass of beer and everything will be wonderful well you see that's the distraction it's wonderful now if you only knew it it's about as wonderful as it's ever going to be standing there at the sink washing dishes is beautiful if you can do it fully Yes. Great, great. Um, sorry to interrupt you. There's, uh, I have a friend who has to leave in a little while and she has her hand raised. So Sharon, why don't you go ahead and with your question? Um, hi, Robert. I, I'm new to your work. I haven't really read any of your books. I've looked at some YouTubes and I'm just, you know, I'm following what everybody is saying here today. But, and I've had a lot of questions, but... <laughs> Uh, finally, here's one that kind of uh, gelled. Um, you talked about uh, a dopamine fix, being a dopamine hack being having um, a drink of scotch. Um, and, and then you said something about addiction. Sorry, I don't remember exactly what. But the thing that I wanted to say is that that's not the best way, probably most of us would agree because that could lead to an addiction. And an addiction doesn't just happen in the present. If we're speaking about an addiction, doesn't that necessarily include behaviors that are going to happen in the future or that we think are gonna happen in the future? And this is all just to say that personally, and I don't have this experience all the time, but I've had it a few times, that what everybody talks about, the capital N now, it actually does include the past and the future because we can 
We can have a memory of the past. We can be making a plan for the future. And it doesn't mean that that has to dominate our awareness and take us out of the present. I don't think the I don't think it's a, a thing of mutually exclusive. Does that make sense? Sure, makes perfect sense. Oh, um, <laughs> perfect. But to but to understand it, when you have a memory of the past, that memory is not the past. That memory is the present. Well. Yes, it's occurring in the present. But it's not just occurring in the present, it is the present. Okay, I'll, I'll, yes, okay. Yes? Yep. If you have some plan for the future. The plan yep. is not the future. The plan is the present. The okay. Future, the future is unknown. Yeah. Having a plan does not mean that the, that what you're planning really happens. It means right. that, it means that right now you're having a kind of daydream or fantasy or or conversation with yourself about what you hope will happen in the future or what you fear will happen in the future. Right. But that's the present. So in the is future. that why you made the comment you did about um, taking the drink of scotch? Yes, you may be one of the ones who can do that for years and not be hurt by it, but a lot of people end up addicted, you know, ill as addicts. So in the present, if I, if I, I, I like alcohol, I'll have a glass of wine in the evening sometimes, not every day. But if I rely on alcohol for my, to raise my dopamine, that's a, not a wise idea. That's my point. I would rather find some hack that's also better for my body and mind than um, drugs and alcohol. But but I think you mean better for your body and mind, not just in the present, but also in the future, right? There is no future in that sense. I don't know what the future will be. Okay. I I know what I... I know what I what I know what I think now. In the future, I might decide that drinking a bottle of wine every night is a great idea. That could happen. That it does happen to people. I don't right. think I'm going to be one of them, but I might be. I I don't know. The future. You see, the future is all we don't know. The future is everything we don't know. The past already happened. We have memories of it, but the memories are not the past. In fact, they're very inaccurate. Um, I saw a demonstration once where this guy was giving a speech and a man in a gorilla costume walked right across the stage. And later when the audience was questioned about what they saw and heard in the speech, most of them never even noticed it. I know that's Yeah, I think I saw that on a TED talk or something. Yeah, did you see that one? Yeah. I, it's 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 ringing a little bell. Yeah. So yeah, you know, and there's also the whole thing about um, if you're, you know, if electrodes are attached to your brain, mm -hmm. they can see from the electrodes that actually, um, your brain responds re responds like a millisecond before your hand presses the button or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that does that sound familiar to you? Well, I've written about it in both of my books, so it oh, is... uh, sorry, I haven't read your. No, books, that, no, that's I'm, I'm just new to your, very new to your work. You're, like maybe you're under two no or three weeks. You're, you are <laughs> under no obligation to read my books. It's fine to not not read them. I will say though, for people who are watching this, that I will give some links below in the description to some extended excerpts from my books that you can read for free without buying anything. So if people- Oh, well, th you know, and you've got lots of stuff on YouTube. You've yeah. got stuff on YouTube, so- Yeah, I'm, I'm highly exposed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if some people like me have stopped reading books, it, you know, YouTube is a great backup. Anyway, thank you so much. I have another class now. So thank you for taking the time to answer well, my questions. It's my pleasure, enjoy yourself. You too.
Uh, okay, Robert, I, I think that uh, uh, Candace Tanner would like to say something. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Candace, and, um, and go ahead. Robert, this is Candace. I've been following your work for years and I get real nervous when I get on a video. But I wanted to say hello and I, I wanted to thank you so much for what you've done for me. You have really pushed me into a, not pushed me, but guided me into a place of, um, I, don't, I don't know how to express it. It's like, it's almost like a no belief, belief stance. And what I wanted to ask you about is because of not, uh, because seeing belief systems and philosophical belief systems and, and religious belief systems uh, as mental, mental constructs um, and um, because of seeing it that way, uh, then I started thinking, well, I'm, I'm in this trough and it feels very lonely here. So I'm noticing, and I've got some great friends, therapists and all, and, but I'm noticing they're, they're not in this with me. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. So um, then I find myself, I still love my friends, but I find myself you know, limiting my conversation. And so it's um, what I want, I'm rambling around here, but what I really wanted to ask is, is not this particular, I don't know how else to say it, in between belief or, or none at all, in and of itself, a, a type of belief or stance? Um, you mean is... Uh... Rejecting religion and spirituality, a stance? Well, I don't know what to call it anymore. It, it's, it, it ha, it's a strange place to be. Well, um, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was an early influence of mine, you know who that is? Oh, but, yes, I've read a lot of Krishnamurti. Yeah, he called this the flight of the eagle, which means that you do it alone. You don't yeah. have a flock of eagles flying across the sky. The eagle flies alone. And there is loneliness involved in that. I feel it. Yeah. But being part of a crowd is not really that great either. Um, then you're in the group mind and you have to uh, agree with things you don't really agree with, because if you don't agree with them, people will be offended and all the rest of this that we all we'll understand. So it comes down to uh, which way you want to go or which way you find yourself going, I, I should say, is more accurate. You're in this place. Unfortunately, you read my books, and now you're damned. <laughs> well, I was I was really leaning that way, and oh. That, no, of, course, it, of course you were. The books, <laughs> the books, that, I mean, that's the point. Um, if you, if you When I read the reviews on Amazon for my books, it's so strange. Most of the reviews are five stars. And then if, at the bottom, there's a bunch of one star things. And the, when you read the review, this is trash. This person doesn't know anything. What a jerk this guy is, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same book, but it hits everyone differently. So it's not the book, it's, it's you. Oh, yes. It's everything that happens in your life is you, including what you make of my book. It's not that it's not that Robert says these things. Yes, I wrote them. But when you read them, the way that you understand what I've written is you. It's your understanding, not mine. Someone might read my book and totally misunderstand it. And they'll say, Robert's book is no good. Well, your understanding of it is no good, I say. If you really understood it, you might think differently. Or maybe you wouldn't. It's hard to hard to uh suss that out entirely but it's all you everything you think and feel that it, that's what myself is myself is everything i think and feel and experience mm -hmm. in this moment and i'm saying there is no other myself we just had to talk about the past and the future but those don't really exist there is no myself in the past there is no myself in the future when the future comes, the myself that we find ourselves in, in that now, may be entirely different from the myself I imagine I will be in the future. Like, I might go on a diet, 
And I might say, I'm going to lose 15 pounds, and in the future I'll fit into this dress and I'll go to the wedding and everyone will say how beautiful I am. And then five minutes before the wedding, I try to get into the dress and I can't. <laughs> you see, we, don't, we can't control the future. We can control the present to a certain extent by m making it an effort in the present. Yes, but even the effort, I can't decide to make the effort. I either make the effort or I don't. And that reveals this present to me. So this is hard to talk about. I understand it. I don't know how clear I'm being. I, you're, I being can't. you're being very clear to me. Okay, thank you. Yes. So right. you got it. I won't belabor the point. No, I, I appreciate it very so much. I encourage you, since you seem to be an eagle, is to enjoy the flight because it all ends it, sooner or later it, it's all over anyway whether you run, run with the crowd or you fly th through the sky and leave no tracks well, uh, yes and, and may i ask one more follow-up to this that i i'm just extremely curious about since, since really i do see that it's a coming out in every moment of the animal nature to in through the you know the conditioning and the mental and the emotional and in that particular moment, I know that in every situation I'm going to react differently. I, I, I truly get that. But if but if I'm reacting to to everything that's around me at that time, including people, um, the air, you know, anything, anything going on in that moment, and then the other person that I'm dealing with, or or all the other persons around me are also reacting to me, then aren't we ping ponging off of each other all the time? In, in a in an action reaction kind of way well yes that's unavoidable that's why i like to spend a lot of time alone i really do i spend most of my hours i spend alone i'm, I'm i mean my wife and i live together in this in this home of ours but even even here with her i spend most of my hours alone doing what i do photography and writing and other things gardening other things like that i'm alone and with my own mind there's no one i have to impress no one i have to look good for no one i have to argue with for me that's good other people need much more uh, society much more interaction with other people and that's fine i understand that we're all different and that's why I prefer to remain silent and not discuss these things. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to hurt anyone. If someone asks me, then I will always be honest. I may be diplomatic to an extent and <laughs> worded carefully, but I will not lie. I won't tell you, yes, there's a God and he loves you. You might want me to say that to you. You might wish I would say it to you, but I won't say it to you. Thank you for not saying it, Robert. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for answering my questions. It's my pleasure. I, I see that you're really a bright and wonderful person. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, Rui, did you have something or should I go ahead with one of mine? Yeah, no, I, I have another thing that sparked once uh, you guys were talking about time and uh, I'm very fascinated about that topic. Um, I, I did um, I did watch, uh, it's an audio book, but I guess it was a book too from David Bowman and, and Judith Krishnamurti. They talked about the ending of time. I don't know if you read that one, Robert. I haven't read it. They, they had a fantastic dialogue, which was really lovely to, to follow as, as one can, uh, but yeah, they, they were trying to use language in a coherent way as much as possible to try to come up to this conclusion of the ending of time, which I think you, you said something along those lines too one time about, um, yeah, the concept of time. And, and, and I wonder if you could say something about the ending of time as, as, as a concept that we seem to seem to impact a lot our lives. We we seem to allow it to run our lives if we have any control over it or we are influenced by it uh, as a concept. But uh, I wonder what do you have to 
add to that part of the ending of time. Imagine a picnic table with an ant on it. And the ant starts walking forward and um, encounters some potato salad and eats a bit of that and then walks further and finds some breadcrumbs and eats a little of that and then gets to the cherry pie and etc. To the ant, it will seem as if time has passed. But the ant is in two dimensions, just on the tabletop. For someone, a three-dimensional observer looking down at the tabletop will see that all of those things were, are in place right now, and there's no time involved. You see that? The picnic table with all the crumbs and cherry pie and all that exists right now in this moment. That's your experience looking down at the table. But the ant's experience is that these things are happening sequentially in time. So time, as I see it, is in the mind of the observer. And for all we know, the universe could be just the way it is and always has been. And we're just experiencing our version of it because we're in um, a body with consciousness and experience things sequentially. We don't know. No one really knows what time is. The physicists use time a lot in their mathematics, but some of them are not sure that, that time really exists either. They, they, they have to use it in order to make certain calculations, but that doesn't prove that. Uh -huh. My personal experience is that we don't know much we're here now without knowing much and that's what i mean by awake mm -hmm. yeah because we talked about before the power of influence although there is no control things do end up influencing us so i can see again a lot of liberation or freedom by not being influenced by time as as a solid thing right as a uh, as something that you need to think about or so from from your experience and from reading your books it seemed that i mean you probably need to have appointments as everybody else but you don't seem to be uh, driven by time well uh it's a little easier when you're not working for a living anymore and you can just do whatever you feel like that does kind of uh take the edge off of time anyway. When I was doing psychotherapy, I'd get up in the morning and every hour would be filled. And I knew in advance, so-and-so is coming here at three o'clock and she's got such and such personality disorder and I'm gonna hear about that for an hour. I mean, I, so in a sense, you see all oh, that was time and programmed space and everything, but inwardly, inwardly i could be free of that because for me it was always right now although i could know that i had the appointment and i could know what probably would occur during that appointment some of it my personal experience as it is just now speaking with you is that there isn't anything else yeah. right right now Rui, for me there's nothing but me and Rui. that's it and I'm not thinking about the future, what might occur. I, it's yeah. not there at all. Later, I might be lying around thinking about the future. What will I make for dinner or whatever? And that's okay too. But when I'm actually preparing the food and I've got the knife in my hand and I'm chopping the onions, I probably will not be thinking about the future because I enjoy, uh, I enjoy cooking very much because it's simple. I know how to do it, and it's very relaxing to just mm -hmm. chop, to just chop without thinking about anything. Yeah. This is what the Zen people are always talking about. They should be, you know, just be in the moment. When you're raking the sand, rake the sand, and that's what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. Not, yes. And, and knowing knowing that, because that's your experience, and. Uh, I mean, I'm not the kind of person with 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 
like the anxious type let's say if there is such a thing but um i was never very anxious um normally very quiet and cool but even even compared to before it, when you're just knowing that there's only this right now in terms of anxiety i mean i don't know if you had previous experience where you felt more anxious um it seems that all all that anxiety or at least a big part of anxiety just disappears just vanishes because when when you just hear you you if it's because you're not thinking anything else past or future so there, there can't be there can't be anxiety when you're just here uh, kind of my experience i don't know what 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 do you think no i wouldn't say that if if anxiety arises then i'm then i'm anxious in the moment and and i see that mm -hmm. it's not it's not a question of living in this purified space where i never feel sadness or anxiety or whatever those things are part of being a human being. For me, when they arise, I just accept it because I have no choice. I didn't make the anxiety. The anxiety arose for some reason. There may be an organic reason for it. We don't know. There may be something wrong with my liver and that expresses itself as anxiety mentally. I don't know that, you see, but I, I'm not in control of what I think and feel. That's what I mean by awake. There's no controller. There's no little robber mm -hmm. here making decisions. It's once you see that, it's a flow. All these feelings and thoughts, whether we think they're negative or positive, has nothing to do with it. They are what they are. The judgment is a, another layer that one might put on top of that, saying, I don't like feeling anxious. I think I'll take a Prozac or whatever it is. Yes, that can happen. But the anxiety was not caused by something I did. Anxiety is a part of life. It's a part of animal life. A cat and, cats and dogs feel anxiety also. You can see it in them. Um, so living in, an, in, a, in a frail body in a cruel world is already an anxious situation to be in. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. I love photography, as a lot of people know, and I spend a lot of my time at it, walking around with a camera. Sometimes I walk around in bad neighborhoods with my camera. So here I am with an expensive camera around my neck, looking through the viewfinder, and I'm completely unaware of anything that's happening behind me. Sometimes when I think about it, I feel anxious. I feel I feel how easily easily victimized I could be by anyone. I, I'm defenseless when I'm photographing like that. Entirely defenseless. And I remember back in the day I had a German Shepherd companion. She died um, and I never replaced her. The pain of her death was too much for me. I didn't want to do it again. So when I had that dog with me, I never felt anxious in that sense when I was out photographing. Never. There she was watching me. Another time in Tijuana, when I wanted to photograph the red light district, I hired a cab driver to drive me around all day, a big burly guy to keep an eye on me so I could do it in this terrible neighborhood. Um, so anxiety is a part of life. And if I feel it, that's, I, I've got to drink the cup. See, this is, mm -hmm. this is my philosophy, Rui, drink the cup right down to the dregs, whatever it is, it's yours. Don't, don't try to get rid of it. Don't try to get rid of anything. Yeah. Just take it and it will change into the next thing. It's a flow. In each moment, as I've said, and I think this is quotable, you have to chew up your life and swallow it bite by bite. And sometimes you have hardly enough saliva to get it down. See, I think that's your wife's experience. It's tough. Mm -hmm. 
It's just tough. She's in a tough spot, right? It's tough. And sometimes it's hard to chew that up and swallow it for her to say, I've got this problem and it's really tough. And I, you know, so, you know, I just sympathize with that. We, we were all going to be in that situation at some time in our lives of getting, getting dealt a bad hand and having to try to play the cards anyway. It's not so easy. So if I feel anxious right now, I don't, but why should I? I'm sitting here in my own home with a cup of coffee. And, you know. But if I'm, if I'm in the city with my camera around my neck in a bad neighborhood, and I feel a little anxious, that's the price I have to pay to get the photograph. That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to, 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 to say that the like anxiety would not be here so per se, but it, it, it's, it, it, seemed, it seemed a bit obvious to me and, and that this total perception, this being in a moment, this flow probably would, would imply it's not like a willing thing, but it would imply almost like, I think you meant use that expression, this radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. and, and as an observation, I would say that that would tend to, so anxiety would, would probably have less to, to, less to feed on, you know what I mean? If, if a person is in that state of mind or state of being of, of radical acceptance, but, but, I, but I understood your point and, and, and thanks, thanks for for taking me there. Yeah, rad what I, the phrase that I use is radical self-acceptance, which means, mm -hmm. as Papa used to say in the comics, I am what I am. See, that's, I'm not trying to improve Robert. It just is what it is. I didn't make it. It's not my problem. <laughs> it's just what it is. <laughs> uh -huh. And that is relaxing. It's relaxing when you're not always expecting yourself to be perfect or or excellent or whatever it is you don't I don't have that expectation if I fuck up I fuck up that's life I mean it happens <laughs> and if if I if I offend someone which I have done often I will then apologize even though I know that I didn't it, I didn't actually decide to offend anyone it wasn't but i apologize anyway because it helps other people to feel better i just learned to do it i'll say gee i'm so sorry i never intended to and then whatever it is although i know very well that i couldn't have done otherwise in each moment we do what we must there's no choice whatever bubbles up bubbles up See, this is, this is very difficult to discuss this, and that it really is. Mm -hmm. When I try to discuss it, I always feel that I've missed the subtlety of it somewhere. I can't put it into words. That's why, uh, depending on nothing, has 630 pages. <laughs> How are we doing here, David? Do we have a lot? Uh, we're doing good. Uh, Carol Oliver has a question. OK. When I feel anxiety, sometimes that probably wouldn't work if I was walking around in a bad neighborhood looking through a camera. But if it's just sort of a free floating thing and I'm, I'm able to sit with it, I just open to it completely. I let my attention go. It's usually a physical experience. And um, I, I keep it company. I don't try to change it or do anything. But if I can keep it company long enough, just the way it is, it does, uh, like you say, it just, well, it takes its full expansion and then it dissolves. I let it just be everything it can be. But once that happens, sometimes it then comes back. I mean, it's not a 100% perfect, but I want to say like, if you put your hand on a stove and your hand is burning, it's automatic to want to take it away. So even though you want to accept what's happening in life, there are times when what you're experiencing is so unpleasant that it's absolutely natural to want to not experience it. Like you said, you felt suicidal sometimes when you were in so much pain all those months and years with your back. So I think <clears throat> I think that something like that, if it, it it's worthwhile because it helps you get through it without pushing it away, but entering into it so deeply that somehow it's allowed to keep moving. 
You're not holding it back. And um, the third thing I wanted to say is um, the way you see things like that they're just happening and there's no future and past and you can't plan. Like, you know, people always say you should have a business plan and, you know, figure out what your next steps are going to be. And of course, the future is not 100 percent. Yeah, It's not really. You can't really tell, but you you have an intention for the future and that's considered important and valuable and useful if you're trying to accomplish something. And um, so even though only now is real, in the now, there might be some value in, well, for people who are in different states of consciousness, like you, what you are in is different than what everybody, what many other of us are in. And I mean, the, the fact that what you see is that everything is just happening by itself and you're not doing anything. Uh, most of us don't experience ourselves that way. We experience ourselves as doing something. So if we are having that experience, what is the value of, of, under, of, of your experience for us? You know what I mean? In an understanding. I, I probably brought up too many things, but. Yeah, you know, well, you don't really know what my experience is. You know, what, what you described that everything is oh, happening but, but you, just from your words right but you, you there's but there there's two there's two uh, interruptions in in that flow in the first place i cannot really adequately express my experience in words i always point this out and then when you hear the words, you don't understand what I intended by them. You understand what you understand by those words. So, yeah. uh, right. So, so I don't really know what you're saying. Yes. I, if you could be inside my mind, um, you might be shocked. Oh, I wish I could. <laughs> well, that would, yes, I've, I've often I've often wished that with people I love, that I could be in their mind and they could be in my mind for a minute and we could just, yes, I mean, but we, but we cannot. See, we're all really alone. We're really alone in our own understanding. You can't, you cannot fully explain to someone else. My intention here is simply to say there, there, that in my experience, in my view, in my opinion, whatever we call it, as I see it, awakening has been misunderstood as some kind of religious or spiritual thing. And that's not what it is. It's a human animal experience where you, a human being has enough intellect some humans to understand that I'm not the doer. And if you really understand that, it's not that you don't make plans for the future. You make them because you have to do whatever you have to do. But that doesn't mean that the plans are going to come out the way you want them to. That's really not within your control. It never is. You can plan everything for the best. You're carrying the cake out to the table and you slip and the cake falls on the floor. You have this plan, everyone will say, what a wonderful cake, Robert, you're a great cook and all that. And no, it didn't happen. You see, that's life. Okay. I do understand that. Yes. But I also see that making plans, like if you want to go to San Francisco, I live in Iowa, you buy a ticket. That's yes, a that's of course. Yeah. We decided to do this meeting, and I plan to be here for it, and we put the word out on the internet and all that. Yes, that's life. All of that has to take place. When I say I'm, that I'm living in the present, I don't mean that I don't understand that later I may need to have dinner or whatever it is buy a ticket to if i want to go on the airplane i have to make a reservation i get all that but i don't deal with that it, it doesn't dominate 
I, I, I really don't, it's, I don't have the words for this. I wish oh, that I... was a good word. Dominate was a very useful word. I, that gives me an understanding. Mm -hmm. It's a background. So and, and what it is, is that I just do what I find myself doing that what I must do, if it's buy a ticket to a, uh, on an airplane, then that's what I have to do. I'm not going to debate with myself about it. I'm not going to theorize and say there's only now, so I don't really need a ticket. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, so, Robert, I'm assuming you want to wrap things up pretty soon, but I, I see one more hand raised. Uh, if, you, if you're up for it. Yeah, I do. I do actually do want to wrap it up, but I don't want to leave any questions on. Okay, so here's the la here's the last question. Go ahead, Lisa. My question. Uh, so, since myself reading the ten thousand things um, and being present for some of the online gathering um, last winter, I found find myself. Um, that I've stopped being so concerned about my consciousness. Like I used to really try to be in present awareness and I sort of gave that up. Um, and it, and it sort of just started happening. Um, and now I find myself getting fully involved in whatever I want. I want rest. I want social activity. I want play. I want creative expression. Um, you know, I'll get into the joy of helping others, but like, I'm not, you know, I'm just doing it because I enjoy it. Um, and my question is, what's the difference between being awake and really not knowing the difference between being awake and not awake? Because it sort of feels like I've just sort of um, slipped more into just existing and I don't really think about um, being, be, the quality of being awake. Um, and I know last last time I was at the gathering, I asked kind of an inflammatory question about Donald Trump and like because he never reflects on himself, like, is he awake? Um, <laughs> which I, I sort of did did a little bit to just kind of instigate some, um, you know, or, you know, uh, debate or whatever. But, you know, I still find myself wondering what's what's the difference between um, being awake and and just being so, um, you know, involved in the day-to-day -day spirit experience that you don't even know the difference between being awake and not awake well it, if i speak to you i'm oh i'm i'm hearing myself speak as if i were another person in a sense, I'm hearing my words objectively. I can't really be objective because I, I still have a point of view. The, the, the listener to these words is not um, unbiased. It, it, all, it already has a, a point of view. But if Donald Trump heard the kind of shit that he says, he'd be horrified. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't hear it, it just flows, it just comes out like shit. What a horrible person, really terrible, terrible. And I, I am so disgusted at the low level of intelligence of the American public that there are so many people who actually buy this. You know, it's a cult of personality, it's so sad. Okay, so that's my rent, political rant, but to get to your question, Awareness is is awakeness. When you're when you're aware, then you're aware of being aware, and then you're awake. You say, "Wow, I, I'm I'm here." That's awake. I am here. This isn't some story. This is it. This is this is as real as it gets. Yes, this is real. That's that's awake, or you you see like I take I take it seriously. I take I take all this is meaningful. It's I'm not saying oh it doesn't matter. It's all bliss. Everything is great. No, not at all. Life is not like that. Not to me. 
right? We're really here. We're animals on the planet trying to live. And that's it. I noticed that someone made a comment about your body on the internet and you, that was wild. You, you were so graceful. That was really excellent. I thought that, you see, that was, I thought that was pretty awake that you could take. Yeah, that's, that was great. That was beautiful. You know what I'm referring to, right? You're laughing. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, well, you know, I mean, it happens fairly frequently, but I think I know the specific incident you're referring to. Yeah. yeah. Right on, sister. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, well yeah. I guess that wraps it up. It's been a wonderful time. David, thank you so much for hosting. My pleasure. I'm going to wish you all well now and sign off on my end. <laughs>